If you have your Bibles tonight, you'd open them to Mark, the fourth chapter. Mark, the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by the Apostle Mark, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 35. We're just going to read six verses tonight <clears throat> through verse 41, standing in honor of the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning at verse 35. So give me just a moment, take a sip of water here. My word. Yeah, the pipes needed a little lubrication. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I have a feeling there's a ferry boat over there in Egypt in that area on the Red Sea that wished they'd had Jesus aboard the other day. Amen. But when the Lord says, let's go to the other side, Mary, he doesn't mean he's going to take you out in the middle of the lake and dump you. Am I right? The Lord said, let's go to the other side. You can bet you're going to get to the other side. That's why he couldn't understand why his, his uh, disciples were so upset by the storm. He said, didn't I say, let's go to the other side? Now, if I said that, then chances are we're going to get there. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me a moment? Master, we thank you, God, for... The service this morning, the great and wonderful presence of God we felt in this place. Lord, as we embark upon the breaking of the bread of life tonight, we need the anointing, the presence, the power of the Holy Ghost to rest upon each and every word that's spoken. God, that it might find its mark in the heart of every hearer. Oh, God, let us today be changed and challenged by this message. Let us know you better than we've ever known you before. If there be anyone in this room, anyone by tape or even over the Internet, that has not yet received a full revelation of your identity and truth, we ask tonight, God, that it would happen tonight, that you would open their eyes and cause them to look heavenward. And as the Apostle Paul at the time of his conversion, let them look upward and say, Who art thou, Lord? And let them hear the answer, I am Jesus. Master, tonight in Jesus' name, move by your Spirit in this place. Help us, lift us up, encourage us this hour, empower us by the Holy Ghost to do great things. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. You know, for so many people, it takes something extraordinary and something supernatural to occur before they fully come to realize just who Jesus really is. Isn't it unfortunate that during the time of the Lord's ministry, all these people were uh, experiencing the Lord's ministry and they were seeing all these wonderful things happen. But sometimes, you know, seeing blind eyes kind of opened, that kind of gets old after a while. And seeing deaf ears unstopped, well, that gets a little old after a while. You know, you kind of get used to it. There's nothing special about it once you've seen it so many times. But there are those people who would wait until something really extraordinary occurred and suddenly that extraordinary miraculous event would open their eyes and cause them to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and realize that he was the, the title of my message tonight more than a man amen it took something extraordinary for them to finally be able to look at Jesus and stop seeing him merely as a human being and as a man and see that there was something else going on there that made him more than a man amen glory to God you know I remember uh, the story of the Lord walking upon the water 
as he came out to the ship, you remember, and the disciples were looking and they saw him coming. And what an extraordinary event that must have been. What an incredible thing to see. How in the world can anyone in their right mind today, from whatever doctrinal background you come from, how can anyone in their right mind doubt the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ when this man was able to step upon a substance that does not support weight and walk on it until he got where he's going, hallelujah, and he did it not even out of necessity, but because he wanted to, hallelujah. He wanted to get where he was going, and he didn't want to take all day getting there. So he walked on the water. Amen. Honey, it's more than a man that's able to walk on the water. I want you to know tonight it's more than a man who's able to call out to that dead Lazarus and say, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden, Lazarus comes leaping out of the tomb. It takes more than a man to be able to speak life back into a dead body that's been lying for four days. It takes more than a man, Mary, to be able to turn water into wine. Amen. And again, point out again, this is an important point. He did this not out of necessity. But he did it as a gift. Do you hear me? The Lord didn't have, they could have run out of wine, and he could have said, oh, well, they're out of wine. But he gave them the gift of turning the water into wine so that they could continue with the celebration and not be embarrassed by the circumstance because it's a poor host who runs out of wine. Amen. According uh, to customs of that day. But it takes more than a man to be able to turn the water into wine. It takes more than a man or even a man child to be able at the age of 12 years old to walk into the temple and confound the scribes and Pharisees of his day and cause them to sit and look and say, where in the world does this boy's wisdom come from? Where does his knowledge come from? Something more than just merely a man was at work. Amen. Something else was going on. Inside that body, there was much more than the soul and the spirit of a human being. It takes, uh, it takes more than a man today to be able to take five loaves and two fishes and break them with his bare hands and hand them out to his disciples and feed multitudes. I mean thousands of people, thousands upon thousands of people. It takes more than a man. So many, even today, have such a difficult time understanding that there was far more to this man we call Jesus than could ever meet the eye. Uh, of his substance, he was but one-third human. A lot of people don't realize this. If you, if you listen to a lot of theology, they'll try to tell you he was half and half. He was half God and he was half human. That's not true. Well... The Bible teaches us that he was, of course, he was made in man's image, which therefore made him body, soul, and spirit. However, we know that he said, I and my Father are one. Therefore, the soul, the substance of God, was within him. And we know the Bible said that the Spirit of God resided within him. So therefore, he did not have a human spirit, neither did he have a human soul. God was his soul. God was his spirit. All that was flesh about him was his body. That's all that was human about him. So one-third of the equation was human. The other two-thirds were divine. The problem is all human beings can see is that one-third that's visible. And for the one-third that was visible, they couldn't see the two-thirds that was invisible until he started walking on the water, until he started telling the seas to shut up, until he started breaking the loaves and the fishes and feeding the multitude. And all of a sudden we had a glimpse into the spirit and the soul of the man that we call Jesus. He was more than a man, far more than a man. Uh, I want you to know today that no man could do at Calvary what was necessary to be done. No man. 
If Jesus Christ were only a man, I'm going to go ahead and say it, the Jehovah's try to tell you that he was a man that God created for the purpose of, you know, dying on the cross. I got news for you. If he were only a man, then his death at Calvary would have been worthless. You know why I know that? Let me tell you why I know that. Psalm 49, 6 through 9. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother... And this term brother in the Hebrew literally is related simply redeem another. In other words, any human being. You can't redeem another man. It says none of them, no matter how rich you are, none of them can by any means, by any means redeem his brother or another man, nor give to God a ransom for him. Did you hear that now? None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever, that he should live forever and not see corruption. What did David just say? He said it is impossible for any human being to redeem another man's life so that his soul should not die. Oh, so if Jesus were just a man, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have amounted to a hill of beans if he was just a man, baby, because no man by any means can redeem another so that his soul can live on and on is what David has just here said. No man by any means, by any means, by any means, regardless of what technique you use, no man by any means can redeem the life of another so that his soul does not die, so that he can live forever. My Lord, have mercy. So right there, that answers the false doctrine that Jesus was merely a man. Right there, that solves that problem. Because if he was, then honey, all your little... Uh, meeting places are null and void. You might as well close them all up because if he was just a man, then he couldn't do anything for you, according to the Word of God. My Lord, have mercy. Listen to me now today. The Word of God tells us in Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to, flee, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood, which who hath purchased with his own blood? God hath purchased with his own blood to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Do you hear me tonight now, children? He's more than a man, Mary. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians five sixteen through 19. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, which is a biblical way of saying, in other words, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Oh, hallelujah. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Hallelujah. He didn't send somebody to do the job. He came down and did it himself. Oh, hallelujah. My God has redeemed the church tonight with his own blood. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. Whew, I've told people before, I'll say it again. When Mary miraculously conceived that child in her womb, all God placed within her, all that was necessary, was the seed. He didn't put a full-grown baby in there. He just put the seed. But the seed of the Father determines the blood type of the child. 
the child gets its blood, oh hallelujah, <laughs> from the Father. Do you hear me now? <laughs> I want you to know the blood that was spilled on Calvary did not match in blood type any blood in any human being on the face of this earth because that blood was created for and by God for himself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It was divine blood. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. My Lord, have mercy. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Woo! Glory. First Timothy 3, verse 16. The Apostle Paul states plainly and without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Not God the Son, not the Son of God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, meaning perfect in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It's obvious he's talking about Jesus, but he said God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Because he's more than a man. I'll tell you tonight, he's far more <laughs> than a man. In John chapter 1, verse 18, the word of the Lord tells us, No man, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He didn't say which was in the bosom of the Father. Right? Wasn't past tense. No, it was a perfect tense. It was the perfect present tense, meaning he's always there. He's always in the bosom of the Father. He's always in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That thought, that plan, that idea, Word, Logos, was with God. It was part of God, and God was part of the plan. He was in the plan himself. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him, or He hath revealed Him. No man's seen God, but when you see Jesus, you, now you've seen God, because He's revealed Him. Okay? John chapter 14, verses 4 through 11. Jesus said, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Oh, listen now. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip? saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You know, there are people that believe when they get to heaven, the Father's going to be here, and the Son's going to be here, and the little dove's going to be flying over everybody, pooping on everything. But you know what, children? That is not the case. Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known that when you look into my eyes, you're seeing the Father. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. Hallelujah. Don't this day forward, you can say, I have seen God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. He goes on to say, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you. I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. He said, remember that old walking on the water routine? Well, if you don't believe me for what I'm telling you, then remember that. You remember when I fed the multitudes with five loaves and two fishes? Well, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, then believe me because of that. 
Remember when I spoke to the storm and caused the sea to calm so that we could pass on a calm sea? Then if you don't believe me for what I'm saying now, believe me for that. If you don't believe me, then if you don't believe because of what I say, just remember when I called Lazarus out of the tomb and that four-day-old dead body got up and walked out of the tomb. If you don't remember, if you don't believe me, believe me for that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo, glory. I love this one God way, I'll tell you. It's a simple, easy thing. <sighs> John chapter 20, verses 26 through 28, and after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, you know, the same doo-doo who had gotten through, the Lord, show us the Father. <laughs> <laughs> and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord... And my God! Oh, hallelujah! Thomas finally got it! He finally understood it! His eyes were finally open! Oh, sometimes it takes something miraculous and powerful to make people realize this man is more than a man! Hallelujah! Glory to God! Thank you, Jesus! My God, have mercy! Whew. Uh, I like to clarify false doctrine when I have a chance. I just want to ask a question tonight. There's a certain group of folks running around telling us that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. His body didn't come back to life like the Bible says. God's a trick player, see. He, what he really did is he caused the body to evaporate. And I'm serious. I'm not even joking. I'm serious. And, and the Lord's spirit man emerged from the tomb, not his physical man. So by their definition, he was not physically resurrected from the grave. Uh -huh. And their logic behind this is, well, how in the world could he have gotten into this room when they were all shut up in there? And the Bible says that Thomas was in there and everybody's in there, and they were locked in, and all of a sudden Jesus appeared without having opened the door. How in the world could he walk on water? How in the world could he calm the sea? How in the world could he raise the dead? How in the world could he heal the sick? Oh my God! He needs a different body to be able to get into that room! Oh, Jesus, help us! Lord, have mercy! My God, have mercy! What stupidity! But their entire organizations built on this ignorance! and stupidity. A man who can calm the sea with the word of his mouth. A man who by the word of his mouth can cause the dead to rise again. A man who can lay hands on the blind and they see. Who's able to put his fingers in the ear of the deaf, pull out those fingers and suddenly they can hear. A man who could do the incredible, miraculous things that Jesus could do. And these bunch of stupid knuckleheads think that he had to come out of the grave of spirit being. Because how else could he have gotten into a locked room? I mean, have you ever heard anything so dumb in your life? I'm telling you, children. But see, this is... The liberation of truth. I keep telling Tommy over and over again, truth liberates. Hallelujah. Truth will set you free. When you know the truth, you know, the sheer logic of it, the sheer simplicity of it will knock you right between the eyes and make you think straight if nothing else does. It just makes pure sense. It's not so hard. It's not difficult to fathom. You're telling me this man is able to raise the dead, but he can't get through a wooden door? Amen. Golly. My Lord, have mercy. 
My God, have mercy. All right, now, let's move on. Have you come to realize yet that Jesus Christ was far more than a man? He was not merely a creation of God, but rather he was God the Creator. Hallelujah. In John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Singular him. Singular him. Singular him. Singular him. Singular him. Singular him. The world was made by him. The world was made by him. The world was made by him. Jehovah did not create the world through him, by him, around him, over him, or under him. He created the world by himself. Hallelujah. Woo. I'm on a rampage tonight, aren't I? Woo, glory. He came unto his own, the Jewish people, and his own received him not. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Woo. Romans 1, 19 to 22. I'll tell you what, I'd like you to point me to a preacher when he preaches that uses the Word of God like I do. I'm not saying that as a brag. I'm not trying to be bragging. But I'm going to tell you tonight, I don't preach morals, opinions. I don't preach some church's doctrine. I'm giving you the Word of God. I'm giving you enough Scripture that, honey, if you question it, when I'm done, there's something wrong with you. Romans chapter 1, 19 through 22, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things of God from the beginning of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. We are the things that are made. Being understood, the things from creation that were invisible, including, he goes on to say, even... His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul is saying, there's no excuse, baby. Because the invisible things of God, right down to His nature in person, have all been revealed to us. Every ounce of it has been shown to us. He said, because that, listen, because that when they knew God, when they knew God... They glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man took the glory of God and said, he's just a man. He's just a man. When they knew God, Paul said, they didn't worship him as God. They knew God. God was standing in the midst of them. They didn't even get it. Ellen, they didn't even know who they were talking to. They didn't get it. They didn't understand the thing that was going on. But the Word of God says, <clears throat> made into the image of, like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things, meaning that they were that they make him to to be of the same substance as animals, as human beings and animals, you know, things that live and die. Amen. I want you to know when this whole thing's over, you're gonna know Jesus was more than a man. When this whole thing's over, you're gonna know Jesus was more than a man. First Corinthians fifteen, twenty four through twenty eight. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. 
Now, I've tried to explain this to people in the past so you all can understand this. Very simple. Without God having to be three people, it's very easy. You've got this physical visage and form that God is using. The man, Jesus Christ. We need that form still. Even though he's not here physically today, when the Lord returns, the church needs that form. We need to see that to identify with him. If he were to sit in the throne as God and then call the church home, we would not be able to see him as he is at that point. But also, after the church is called home, there's this little thing called the Battle of Armageddon, where the Lord returns for the second time to planet Earth, and he fights a battle physically, literally, on Earth's soil. And to do that, he needs this Form. He needs this personage of the man, Jesus Christ. But what Paul is telling us in the Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, is that when all this is over, that physical visage is then going to, in a sense, evaporate and incorporate back into God so that he can sit as God because it's no longer necessary that he have this visage. You see, that's all he's saying. It's not a hard thing to understand. Now listen to this in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, him, singular, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So there's one throne, and God is in that throne. Now listen, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Where have you heard those words before? Didn't Jesus say that in Revelation chapter 3? I am Alpha, I am Omega, the beginning and the end. Well, honey, here God is saying it, so there must be a conflict, obviously. No, there's no conflict, because we know that they're one and the same. It's just a difference in manifestation. He's speaking now as God, whereas before he was speaking in the personage of Jesus Christ, okay? He goes on to say, Unto... Uh, I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 7. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear and crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's one throne. But God and the Lamb sit in the same throne. Is it possible that God and the Lamb are the same? Amen. You get it? Okay. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Not, and their servants shall serve them. 
if God and the Lamb are two different people, then who are we going to serve, the Lamb or God? Am I right? You see, my friend, it's not hard to understand what we teach and what we preach and what we believe. This message, a lot of people misrepresented it over the years and tried to make folks be afraid of it. Like this oneness message with some goofy screwball doctrine. It's not goofy screwball, it's easy. It's really not as hard as you think. It's a whole lot easier to understand. And it makes a whole lot more sense uh, than the Roman Catholic invented doctrine of the Trinity which didn't even come into official uh, acceptance until 325 A.D. But see, again, most Christian people don't know that. You go to a Trinity church, you assume the Trinity is what Paul and Silas preached. No, Paul and Silas didn't know nothing about the Trinity. That doctrine wasn't even begun to be uh, debated until hundreds of years after the apostles were dead. So nobody was present with apostolic authority, who could stand and say, oh, no, 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 God is not three people. God is not three people. And, by the way, there was tremendous, there was tremendous uh, resistance to the Trinity doctrine when the Roman Catholic fathers tried to introduce it in 325 80. There was a lot of resistance. It took them over a century to get it ratified. So that should tell you how severely it was, it was pushed against, okay? And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. According to some belief systems, I guess you'd have a telephone directory full of names upon your forehead. <laughs> his name, one name, shall be in their foreheads, it says, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Listen, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Behold, who comes quickly? We've just been reading about God and the Lamb, the throne of God and the Lamb. Who's speaking here? Of course it's God. God is saying, Behold, I come quickly. But now listen, Titus, this is my closing tonight. So Titus 2, 11 through 14, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. Oh, hallelujah, for the blessed hope. And the glorious appearing, oh my, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Titus said the church of Jesus Christ is waiting for the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. They're one and the same tonight. Hallelujah. We're not just waiting for the Son of God. We're waiting for God. Hallelujah. To come and take his people home. Glory to the Lamb of God. Woo, glory. Listen, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Children, the language of Scripture is clear. We know Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. Any doctrine that would try to divide God into pieces, any doctrine that would try to uh, relegate the Lord Jesus Christ to a lesser position than that of the Father himself is a lie. I'm telling it to you tonight straight and plain. Any doctrine that tries to tell you Jesus Christ is anything short of Jehovah God the Father is a lie. How do you know that? But I'll tell you, Isaiah 9 and 6, for his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting 
Father. If he was to be God the Son, then why in the world does the Word tell us that he is the, the, the singular, the everlasting Father? Hallelujah! My Lord, have mercy. Do you see how simple it is? I want you to understand tonight, if there's anything this church is going to do, it's going to lift up Jesus. We're going to lift him so high because he's worthy to be lifted up high. My God became my redeemer. My father became my brother so that he could be my God. How do you like that? Isn't that something? And people say, how in the world could God do that? Honey, how could he not? Why don't you tell me how it would be impossible for God to be the Father and the Son at the same time without being two different people? Why don't you go ahead and explain to me? Give me good, solid theological evidence for why it is not possible for God to be both the Father and the Son simultaneously. You can't think of any, can you? Because why, why couldn't he? If you think about it for half a second, why couldn't he? The Bible said the earth is my throne. The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. God is big. He's real big. Man is small. He's real small. When God manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that wasn't even his finger in that, in terms of substance. That wasn't even God's little tiny finger. And still he was able to raise the dead. And still he was able to calm the seas. Still he was able to walk on the water. Still he was able to feed the multitudes. But that didn't mean that God had to be a separate person from this man. No, he was manifesting himself as this man while at the same time he's filling the heavens. But that doesn't mean he's two different people. You get it? It's pretty easy. Amen? More than a man. Remember that. Tonight when you go home, remember he's more than a man. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. And you know what, Mary? I'm going to let you close the service for us tonight, if you would, in prayer.